want to introduce the first talk, which um, is from Timnit Gebru, who is on the team leading up artificial or ethical artificial intelligence research at Google. And so Timnit co-leads the ethical artificial intelligence research team. Uh, she's been working to reduce potential negative impacts of AI. She earned her doctorate under the supervision of Fei-Fei Li at Stanford University in 2017 and did a postdoc at Microsoft Research in the FATE team. So also working on many of these same topics and trying to understand what some of the challenges are and how to address them. She's the co-founder of Black and AI and it's a, a place for sharing and fostering collaborations and discussions initiatives to increase the presence of Black people in the field of artificial intelligence. Um, and I just wanna say, I mean, Tim Need has made some contributions um, that I think are really impressive including her work on gender shades and some of the other really important projects that have highlighted the you know challenges that some algorithms face in dealing with the everybody who might be used using that algorithm or the algorithms may be used upon and so um i just want to kick off the talk by saying she's somebody that i admire and is working on very um very relevant and challenging work that all of us need to be thinking about. And hopefully her talk will get everybody thinking about um, what are the lived experiences outside of the experiences that you all have and how can we incorporate that into our uh, machine learning. So we'll kick off the talk now. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you to the organizers of BayLearn who um, invited me to give this talk. Um, and I um, today I wanted to give a talk uh, called The Hierarchy of Knowledge in Machine Learning and Related Fields and Its Consequences. I haven't given this talk before, and I don't know if I've even given this kind of talk before, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so um, I wanted to give this talk after I heard um, Ruha Benjamin speak at iClear 2020. If you haven't seen her keynote yet, I highly recommend that you do. And so she said computational depth without historic or sociological depth is superficial learning. She further expanded and she said um, an ahistoric and asocial approach to deep learning uh, can capture and contain, can harm people. A historically and sociologically grounded approach can open up possibilities it can create new settings, it can encode new values and build on critical intellectual traditions that have continually developed insights and strategies grounded in justice. My hope is we will all find ways to build on that tradition. Um, and then later I um, heard this uh, conversation with Ruha and Meredith Whitaker and actually something, that, 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 this is something obvious but I, I never really thought about it and she said, we have so many coding camps. I think I think I'm par uh, paraphrasing, but 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 no social science boot camps for computer scientists. And in fact, I'm I'm involved in such a, a coding camp called Addis Coder. Uh, it's a one month algorithms class for um, high school students that was started by Jelani Nelson um, in Ethiopia. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to first talk about how this hierarchy of knowledge and machine learning has manifested itself in, in my life and my education and how I viewed the world. And then later talk about um, how I think it has um, manifested itself in the field as a whole and give a few examples. And so please bear with me um, as I tell uh, some stories. So I grew up enjoying math and physics. Um, I, I, I remember enjoying um, physics for since I was like third or fourth grade. Um, and I, I grew up in Ethiopia, and um, I, I learned these subjects um, as subjects that are completely destroyed from the world. Uh, what do I mean by that? They, whenever I thought about instability, um, politics, um, or social movements, I never thought about them as connected to any of these subjects that I really liked. And sometimes um, that attitude really, really helped me because Whenever something is falling apart, whenever the world I thought was falling apart in my life and I felt like I had no control what was going on. So for example, I, I had to leave home when I was 15 and um, I just felt like I, I didn't really have control over my destiny. I, I found that 
you know, working on these subjects um, and thinking of them as something that was disjoint from political instability helped me feel like I had some sort of control over my life. Um, I also love dancing and I love music um, and I, um, I, I'm so sad that we can't social dance uh, as we used to in the picture uh, that I'm showing here. If anybody is a, is a dance lover, um, I suggest that you check out Kobe Party. Uh, which is a, a group of DJs who have been um, playing music continuously for um, over 208 um, days, I think, um, since COVID started. So the, the first um, time I remember trying to connect some of these things that I love to some of these other things that I love, like music, to um, subjects that I was mostly spending my time trying to learn, was when I was trying to find to figure out why I felt like I learned um, dance or music better sometimes. And most recently I came across this article by Rachel Thomas that sort of talks about this, which is so interesting to me. So Rachel Thomas is a co-founder of Fast.ai um, and she talk, she's also a mathematician by training. And she talks about how uh, she's, uh, she's coding someone else, I believe, um, Paul Lockhart. And she talks about how when we learn music or dance or something like that, we have the big picture in mind. We know what we're working towards. But when we learn many of these other things, many of these other disciplines, I remember, for example, when I took EE 101, um, EE being electrical engineering, we don't first see the, the big picture of what we're working towards. We start working on the details. Like I remember talking about convolutions or learning about how to convolve various functions before I even understood why I should care about convolutions, the big picture of why they're important. And um, so I never, uh, going back, I never um, I thought of any form of social change as connected to um, any of these fields, right? Um, I was always involved in some sort of, you know, movement or thinking about social change a lot. I am um, ethnically Eritrean and, and, and uh, struggle for social change has always been something integral to the Eritrean identity, but I never connected to science. Um, and, and thinking back, it's because I was taught to think that way. Um, so when I first started working, my first job out of college was um, working at Apple. Um, so I started working at Apple. I worked between 2005 and 2011 at Apple. And um, the, job, the picture in the first is, um, it, it, on the left is, um, or the first picture is, a um, key, like a, I tried to create a, an electronic piano key in, in a class that I took um, in my very first lab class as an undergrad. And I think that's probably what got me my um, internship at Apple. And then the very right side was um, uh, when I was uh, working there part time and we wanted to create some sort of clock generator. And I remember I was very interested in um, Delta Sigma modulators. And I have this book, Understanding Delta Sigma Data Converters. and you know, I was fascinated by them and, and just the signal processing side, but I, I never thought about, like, for example, why Delta Sigma modulators became um, effective or why any of these communication paradigms became effective and their connection to World War II and radar or anything like that. Um, along those lines, I learned a lot about the transistor. Um, and I heard William Shockley's name come up over and over again, but I never was taught his connection to eugenics. I was never taught that he spent a big portion of his life advocating for it. For example, um, there's a number of quotes here, but he talks about one of the things he says is the view that the U.S. Negro is inherently less intelligent than the U.S. white came from my concern for the welfare of humanity. I also never learned about how um, tech-based institutions and labs, whether it's industry or academic, made their money um, or uh, gained their influence. Um, this is an example that this is an article that talks about MIT, for example, and it says that similar to how many universities are reckoning with their um, connection to slavery, they should also work explicitly to acknowledge their contributions to human suffering in international conflicts, aka war. Um, I am someone whose life has been deeply, deeply affected by war, but still 
I never made the connection to with all of these things I was very interested in, whether it's math, physics, or um, engineering, um, and international conflicts. I never learned about how tech companies affect the world. I never learned about um, labor unions and labor history um, and how they were connected to some of these companies, Ford, whether it's AT&T or Bell Labs. The only thing I remember learning along these lines is that Stanford was so proud of its role in creating Silicon Valley. I learned st little stories like, for example, how Terman um, uh, lent money to Hewitt and Packard when they needed it and, and this is how Hewitt and Packard started or various other things. Um, and so all of these things are connected to what's called the view from nowhere. The fact that you have to think of tech as something neutral. The fact that you disconnect it from um, everything else that's going on in the world. And it turns out many people, feminist scholars, people in science, technology, society, um, uh, critical race theorists, and so many of these disciplines have been criticizing this view from nowhere and its effects on science and technology for a very long time. But I never heard this term until literally like last year. And why? I would say that's because of the hierarchy of knowledge. The hierarchy of knowledge that taught me that being a good engineer meant decoupling these things um, and showing how good you are that's about um, something you know technical. Um, the hierarchy of knowledge that says there are some things that are social disciplines, soft skills versus hard skills, and how really thinking, infusing your understanding of society into your work was not a good thing. Um, the hierarchy of knowledge that tells us that we need to be seen as quote unquote neutral, um, whereas we know from these critiques of the view from nowhere, for example, there was no such thing as something that's neutral. So during my PhD, I, I just wanted to make sure that I was never seen as quote unquote an activist. So any of the things I did that were related to social change were very distinct from what I considered to be my quote unquote technical work. And I wanted to make sure that I made those thing, two things separate. And I remember that my advisor was the first person who told me that I should um, not make them um, distinct and that I should um, consider joining these two things in my PhD and, and moving forward. And I actually fought her on that. I, I, I didn't agree with her at first. So um, this term of being an activist, um, there are many people who I heard uh, use this term um, to describe me now rather than a scientist. And it actually happened recently, like last year, I think, after my talk um, at Caltech, I, I went to visit and I gave a talk. And Pietro, Pietro Peruna, I remember on 101 afterwards, told me that I was, quote unquote, weaving in and out between science and activism. Um, and you know, that I was weaving in and out between science and my view of how the world should be. And I was trying to explain to him that you can never deco decouple the, of these things. Um, your view of the, how the world should be is always influencing your science. And um, recently, El Mahdi, uh, who is a, an incredible scientist, he just um, uh, graduated with his PhD at, from EPFL, and he's going to be an incoming professor at Ecole Polytechnique. Um, he actually <laughs> felt the need to write about this on Twitter, um, and he was talking about how he hears many people describe me as an activist, and he has no issues with that, but he um, describes how, how people use it and why um, they don't use it in the most flattering way. So he gave examples of Moroccan journalists, for example, and when they're, when they're um, discussed by others as activists versus journalists, it's usually to distinguish them from the journalists and to then persecute them. Um, and then he discussed you know, this, this um, thing called the Carl Sagan effect, which I didn't know. And he says, um, there's this thing called the Carl Sagan effect where scientists enge engaging in public dissemination are perceived as less productive than those who are not. Well, the opposite is true. Um, and so I found this to be interesting because while all of this is going on, there's also all of these conversations about interdisciplinary and how it's important. Um, many people talk about how it's important to bring knowledge from other disciplines into machine learning. And this has happened, for example, with physics-based models, um, the Ising model or 
other kind of um, uh, research that's going on right now, ideas from game theory that's been incorporated in so many different ways, like for example, generative adversarial networks. So why, why not ideas from history? Uh, why no, not ideas from critical race theory? Why not ideas from um, anthropology? Why are they not as celebrated as the ideas from, um, let's say, physics or, or game theory that we talk about? And I would say it's because of gatekeeping and the hierarchy of knowledge. And this has been happening for a very long time. Um, I talk about this a little bit um, in a book chapter that I wrote on race and gender um, for Oxford's Handbook of AI Ethics. Um, and so this book, Programmed Inequality by Mar Hicks, Mar Hicks is a historian that I follow and I learned so much from, um, talks about uh, some of the history of, um, of computing in England, for example, in Britain, and talks about how, obviously, m many people know by now the first computers were women. And um, the discipline was even advertised as a very um, feminine discipline. Um, many of the advertisements had pink in them, and, and the operators were considered, you know, it was just considered a job for women. And at some point, when this discipline started getting, gaining power and it started becoming lucrative with the advent of the personal computing, um, it, it started um, being considered a man's job, and it started being considered not a woman's job. Um, and so this is, again, a gatekeeping by people who started having power uh, towards people who don't have as much power. Um, and so this gatekeeping is, all, is always happening, right? I heard about, and I don't know if this is true, I heard about how MIT doesn't have a statistics department because the mathematics department thought that had statistics people weren't so, you know, hardcore enough. Um, and so this is, this is, and in computer science, this always happens. What is real computer science? What is real computer vision? What is real machine learning? What is real X? This is a gatekeeping mechanism. Um, and so uh, people have been uh, working to decolonize many different disciplines um, and move away from this hierarchy of knowledge and gatekeeping. One example is history. Um, there are movements, I know for example in uh, South Africa, there are movements in many other places to decolonize history. What does that mean? Um, so for example, um, acknowledge that oral histories are very important in many indigenous communities. Acknowledge that the way in which we categorize knowledge production right now, what we think is important versus not, is very colonial. Um, there are examples in art, for example, and other disciplines. Um, so in my own work, um, most recently, I've been trying to bring ideas that are mostly based out of my current discipline. Um, so I've been trying to uh, bring ideas that are uh, based out of, out of my uh, current discipline to my current discipline. And I wanted to give a few examples of, of those. So one is, for example, from electronics. Um, and so I used to be a hardware engineer and analog circuit designer. And I made a very roundabout sort of, um, a, a, I took a very roundabout path to uh, being a computer science, a uh, computer vision uh, PhD student. But still, you know, I took my PhD quals and everything. and. Um, in electronics. And at the time, I thought that my um, background in electronics didn't really help me with my um, research or anything like that. I actually thought that I was behind. You know, there are all these people who are reading all these books and have, have been working in, in these disciplines since they were undergrads or or even before. And here I am, uh, who, are, who is a latecomer to this um, discipline. But as I was working in, um, in after, after I graduated, um, I was working at Microsoft Research uh, with my colleagues, Ham, Hannah, Kate, um, Jen Warman Vaughn, and Hal, who I really like. Um, they, they've all been really great to me, and I, I feel like nurtured my creativity. Uh, we wrote this paper called um, Data Sheets for Data Sets um, that included also Brianna uh, Vichuni, who's a, a PhD student, and Jamie Morgan, who is a professor at the University of Washington. And so this concept of data sheets for data sets came out of this, this um, thought. Um, in electronics, um, every time I worked with some sort of component, I always got to see the data sheet. 
associated with this component. And that data sheet talked to us about, told us about its non-idealities, um, different characteristics, um, and we just never had any of this in data sets. We, if I wanted to use a data set, I didn't know what I should or shouldn't use it for, what the various distributions were, what the motivation of the creation was, um, or any of these things. So I thought that the first, it, it was so obvious to me that this idea in electronics should be transferred to, um, to, our, uh, to the machine learning or computer vision setting. Um, the same for, uh, and, and uh, Meg Mitchell and many of our collaborators uh, were thinking about this um, uh, for models, on the model side. And at the same time, actually, Emily Bender Batia Freeman uh, wrote a paper called Data Statements for NLP, uh, which was uh, basically the same idea for, for NLP. Um, and this idea was not about math, or it wasn't about um, some sort of algorithm. It was about building a foundation. It was about a process that was missing. Similarly, um, Unso Jo, who is a historian, a PhD student at Stanford, and I wrote a, a paper about uh, bringing ideas from archival history uh, to machine learning. And so this, again, was not about math or algorithms, but it was about process. It was about a foundation, a process that's missing, a, a paradigm that's missing in machine learning, and how, by showing how uh, what kind of paradigm exists in archives. Um, so for example, we talked about how there is so much rigor in da the data collection practice in archives. First, people have a mission statement, then they have a collection development policy, then they have an appraisal process that determines whether each document should be kept or not. Um, there is uh, a processing and, tech, uh, and, and indexing that happens afterwards. And there are so many resources and full-time curators that um, are involved in data collection practices, whether, whereas right now, this is really an afterthought. Um, we're trying to get um, data from easily accessible sources with a, a little, as little resources as possible. And um, uh, another work is on understanding race and, gen and gender, right? And so this work, Gender Chase, was um, led by Joy Bull Amini, who worked on this for, since 2015. And so what we showed in this work was that the error rates um, of automated facial analysis tools um, approached, um, you know, were, were really high for darker skinned women and um, as contrasted to lighter skinned men, that showed almost no error at all. And so this brought knowledge from, first of all, our lived experiences. So we, first of all, understood that race is an um, unstable co social construct across um, time and space. So in, in, uh, rather than doing this analysis by race, we did it by skin type. So we looked at, we annotated a data set, um, we created a new data set, annotated it by gender and by skin type, meaning uh, we use something called the Fitzpatrick skin type classification system. So we looked at whether someone was, you know, how light or dark their skin um, type was. And we did this because we know that race doesn't tell you how necessarily how light or dark someone is. Um, it, it, and also whether what someone's race is in Brazil or in the US or in South Africa are completely very different. Um, and they also change across time. Whereas some other people have been doing this kind of analysis by race. So what we did is we, um, in this particular work, we looked at um, the uh, APIs um, that were commercially sold and um, that uh, what they did was they, they look at a picture and they tell you whether uh, this picture is that of a man or a woman, uh, binary. And um, so if you look at the, um, if you look at the error rates and if you flip a coin, uh, you would, it would be, random chance would be, you know, 50%, uh, right, if you just guessed. And so if you see here, at the time when we wrote the paper, um, IBM's um, uh, error rate was approaching random chance, so was phase plus plus. And of course, all of this has changed since then. But where, what we did here is we brought our understanding of, you know, the racial social construct, the gender social construct, and of course there are many issues uh, with, um, 
the APIs themselves, first of all, purporting to talk about automatic gender record, purporting to um, tell someone's gender from their face, which I'll talk about later. But what we did is we brought our understanding of our lived experiences, race, and uh, the gender construct. And uh, Joy was also doing experiments on herself to see whether um, uh, face detection systems, open source, uh, worked. And she found out that they didn't work on her, but they worked on uh, other lighter skinned um, people uh, like her roommates. And so they worked on her when she put on a mask. And so these are the kinds of, um, this is the kind of knowledge that we brought into this work. Again, it wasn't algorithmic or it wasn't mathematical knowledge, but the most important knowledge was our lived experience and, some, and, and understanding of uh, the racial and gender construct and how um, it, social inequity exists and how uh, tech could amplify it sometimes. Um, another work that also brings ideas from uh, from many di other disciplines is this paper on diversity and inclusion metrics for subset selection. And so uh, this is a work with so many people. So uh, Meg, uh, Dylan Baker, uh, Nyaling, who is a uh, uh, and it, she has uh, actually she's a computer scientist, but she has a lot of econ training. Emily uh, Ben Hutchinson, Alex Hanna, who's a social scientist, uh, me and uh, Jamie Morrison, who is a, a, a theoretical uh, computer scientist. So this brought together ideas from so many disciplines because diversity and inclusion are very social um, and complex topics. So the question here was, let's say you need to be in a, um, s uh, selecting a subset from a set. So let's say, for example, this could happen in image search situations where you know you want to uh, search for something and you have a huge set, which is all images in the world, and you want to select that subset. How do you score whether this subset is diverse versus inclusive? Right? How do, how do you make this decision? Where it's very complicated, but um, we could at least try to bring ideas from uh, social science, organization, organizational social science, and econ, um, and try to understand its characteristics. So, so these are examples of some papers where I feel like I was um, trying to bring ideas from outside of my discipline, uh, working with so many people to bring ideas uh, from outside of my discipline to my discipline. And a lot of times, um, I think <laughs> I would say in this in these cases, my biggest contribution was being able to um, successfully bring other people's ideas into fruition. And I would say the papers that were effective were effective because of a number of reasons. Um, the first one was the focus on, you know, the foundation of building a house before figuring out the doc decorations. What do I mean by that? A lot of these things that we worked on were about process, data sheets, model cards, uh, gender sheets. They were about changing the process by which people did things, changing the process by which people um, collected data sets, changing the process by which people tested their models and documented them, um, changing the process by which um, they thought about what um, kinds of um, labels to test for. Um, it wasn't about, you know, so there's many works that, for example, try to have a universal definition of fairness or something like that. I feel like that's, that's sort of the decoration. It was more about building a foundation for our work, uh, of trying to build the right foundation um, to make the kinds of impacts that we wanted to make. The second one is focus on impact. Um, here's one example of that. Um, well, after we wrote the paper model cards, um, we could have just stopped there, right? But especially Meg Mitchell, uh, my co-leader of the Ethical AI team, and Parker Barnes, who's a, a project manager, a product manager, worked on this for two years to bring it into fruition with many, many different teams. Um, and so to have at least like a pilot to show people how this might look. If we just cared about the paper and that's it, we would have just written the paper and moved on. Uh, there are so many examples of that, and I think Joy Bolomini actually is one of the best examples I've seen of someone who has focused so singularly on impact of the one paper that she wrote rather than jumping from paper to paper. Another one is domain ex bringing my own domain expertise, my own lived experience into my research and encouraging others to do the same. And also not abstracting out um, from uh, the context, um, making sure that I think about what are the different contexts under which I imagine this research to, uh, to be deployed. Another one is collective movements. Um, so what are examples of this? 
Um, right after Gender Shades, there was this paper called Actionable Auditing by uh, Deborah Raji, who you can see here uh, on the cover of a New York Times magazine, and Joy Bulamini, who is my co-author on Gender Shades as well, and who led that work. Um, and once this paper came out, so this paper talked about how it's important to audit um, various models once they've been deployed and, and, and kind of makes a comparison of the ones that are audited versus the ones that are not and what kind of change is made based on auditing. And one of the things that this paper showed as a byproduct was that Amazon's recognition tool uh, that was still being sold to um, uh, police uh, could have the same types of biases that were shown um, in gender shades along race and skin type. I mean, uh, skin type and gender. And so, of course, uh, once this paper came out, um, Amazon had VP after VP trying to discredit the work of these two black women, one of whom was an undergrad at the time and one of whom was a PhD student. And they really didn't have any support. Their institutions didn't support them. Other people didn't want to risk their careers or tenure or whatever it is to support them. And um, what we did was that uh, my uh, co colleague Meg and I spent literally one whole year, I'm, I'm sorry, one whole month, not one whole year, one whole month crafting a paper, uh, a rebuttal uh, to the to the VPs and asked um, many people like Aima Anand Kumar, Eric Lerner Miller, Yoshua Benjo, and many other people to uh, and Sammy Benjo to sign this letter, this open letter that was then um, covered by a lot of news outlets. Oh, and we, we took a huge risk um, doing this, actually. And I literally went to Sam and I was like, well, I might get fired for this, but this is important. This is about making impact. Um, and other people are not doing it. Um, and so then after that, um, Amazon couldn't really uh, say that this um, work was erroneous. Um, so Deb, this person uh, who led this work uh, uh, here um, told me that before she came to Black and AI, she was about to drop out of the tech industry as a whole. And so uh, Black and AI is this organization that my colleague, Reddy Dabib, and I co-founded. And, um, and so Deb said that once she came to Black and AI, she saw a lot of people who looked like her. She saw a lot. She felt supported um, and was unapologetic in her differences, how she called it. And um, this is a collective network, a collective movement that protected people like Deb um, because there's very few of us who care so, this much about our community and, and will take risks um, in order to minimize the negative impacts of um, technology to our community. Uh, Joy has this um, uh, organization called the Algorithmic Justice League that's also about uh, research, collective action, and much of this research and much of um, much of the bans that you see on face surveillance um, that are going on across the country and a lot of the movement, I would say are due to her research, art, and other advocacy. Speaking of which, art. So Joy, well, after we came up with this paper, Gender Shades, um, didn't really stop um, at the paper or jump to another paper. She did so much stuff. Like, for example, uh, she was a headliner at um, Afropunk, uh, and uh, she created this um, uh, uh, spoken word called AI Ain't I a Woman. Uh, Shalini, uh, the uh, director of this um, documentary, Coded Bias, um, created this documentary, uh, which is now shown all over so many institutions I'm seeing, it, and if you haven't watched it, you should. Um, so these are like many different modes of communication that allowed us to have um, this impact. And uh, recently there was this work that came out of DeepMind. So uh, Marie Therese Shakir uh, and uh, Mohammed and William Isaac came out with this work called Decolonial AI. And so they try to talk about how to decolonize AI, how to use decolonial theory to decolonize um, AI. And one of the things they talk about is um, th these different um, hierarchies of knowledge and different modes of communication. And so uh, at Black and AI, and uh, uh, really thought it would be really great to have a decolonial AI collective. And so uh, we asked them and many others um, who've done similar work to create this decolonial um, 
uh, AI collective. And so this is a collaboration between organizations like the Deep Learning, Dawa Black AI, Data Science Africa, and many others. And so please check it out. Um, you'll see some um, blog posts and resources and many other things that um, hopefully um, as we go along, uh, the decolonial, decolonial AI team uh, will add um, resource, resources. So again, like I said, oops, sorry. Um, so I realized that actually, I think the first person to show me this paper was Jen Wartman Vaughn. And I think it was when we were writing the data sheets paper that many of the things that I was thinking, of course, they've already been said by other people. Of course, they've already been raised by other people. So this, this um, paper by Kerry Westaff um, really talks about many of the things that I was talking about. Um, and I believe this was a, um, a keynote that she gave at ICML 2012, and I heard it wasn't really well received. Um, but what she says is that there are many things you need to do um, in research to, to make sure that your research has impact. You have to phrase a, a problem as a machine learning task. You have to collect data. You have to select or generate features. You have to choose or develop an algorithm. You have to choose metrics to conduct experiments. You have to interpret the results, publicize the results to the relevant community, and persuade the users to adopt the technique. There are so many of these things that need to happen in order for your research to actually do something. And I think what I talked about more is um, the, the pink sides, right? The pink sides and the blue sides. But for some reason, what is valued in our conferences and our uh, journals and in and, and our interviews, et cetera, et cetera, is the green part, which says choose or develop an algorithm or choose metrics and conduct experiments. And in fact, actually, I didn't put this in my um, slides, but there is a, a, a paper I read called um, The Values Implicit in Healthcare. Uh, is it inequity calculations? I don't remember exactly, but it is a very good paper that talks about how every single, the values that you encode into every single part of this um, process, choosing metrics and experiments, choosing an algorithm, little things like are you going to, uh, what kind of error rates do you prioritize, ratios or, um, or um, subtra uh, subtractions or anything like that. So everything we do is value laden and for some reason, uh, we're valuing this choosing or developing an algorithm and choosing metrics and conduct, conducting um, experiments. Another paper that I really um, thought was very much in line with some of my thoughts here, here was um, the moral character of um, cryptographic work, which is by Philip Rogway in 2015. And I also heard from Manuel Savin, and I'm not sure if this is true, that this work was not very well received at all, and that Philip Rogway was basically shunned from some of it, um, his colleagues um, in cryptography. I'm not sure if this is true, but. Um, if so, then I don't know about like my current um, <laughs> keynote. I hope I hope I don't have that fate. But the in the moral character of cryptographic work, he also talks about how it's very important for some of the work in cryptography to be grounded in reality. So if you're always abstract, abstracting things out and you're saying, oh, Al, there's Alice and Bob are trying to communicate, and here's the adversary. You're, you're abstracting things out way too much, and so um, the works, the kinds of works and solutions you come up with are really not going to be useful. So it's really important to think about who exactly is Alice in, in, in the real world? Who exactly is Bob? What kind of characteristics does um, the adversary have? And so um, in terms of me, you know, I have heard other people tell me, like, like El Mahdi wrote in, um, on Twitter, people saying, you know, but what does she really do in computer vision? But what was really the algorithmic component of her work? And so my question is, why is this the pinnacle? Why, why is this considered the pinnacle? Um, and really my answer is, it's because of the hierarchy of knowledge. Um, it's a, because of the hierarchy of knowledge that devalues many different kinds of work. One example that is devalued because of this hierarchy of knowledge in our field is any work um, regar regarding data, any work regarding labor practices. So I really um, recommend this book by Mary Gray, who, who apparently just became a MacArthur, got a MacArthur Genius Award, which I think is um, very well deserved, that talks about how um, there is a lot of human labor uh, in, in our field, a lot of human labor that we like to kind of forget about. And um, actually, um, Ali Al-Khatib has a, 
an article called um, Anthropological HAI, who, who, that, where he talks about that. He talks about how um, researchers, we want, to, we want to forget about our privilege, right? We want to forget about all the other labor that's going on um, in our work. So all the crowdsourcing, all of the data annotation that we uh, try to sort of like just um, automate, there is a lot of human labor there. And in our hierarchy of knowledge, that labor is completely devalued. And Mary talks about how this is creating a second class, a group of second class citizens because of uh, this, uh, this attitude that we have because of the tech industry. So when you devalue this kind of work, when you devalue work um, regarding data sets, for example, you start having many, many different issues. There are works by, for example, Vinay and Ababa um, that talk about how one, one example is that pyric, uh, what is it, large image data sets, a pyric, pyric, I don't know how to say this word, win for computer vision. I am, this is a very recent paper that they came out with that talks about large computer vision data sets and some of the problematic data collection annotation practices they have. Um, Emily Denton talks about, um, she has this talk at um, a New York's um, workshop called, I think it's a rest retrospective workshop, Critical Perspectives in Computer Vision, talking about all of the issues that can arise when you're talking about generative modeling. Some of our uh, data sets that we have, like Celeb A, and the, for, starting from the labels that they have, like attractiveness, you know, should we really be judging attractiveness? Um, and so I highly recommend some of these works by Alex Morgan um, and uh, Emily and uh, Ababa and Vinay if you uh, want to read more about this. Other works I see are like works on, you know, make, make X fair, make gender recognition fair without even thinking whether gender recognition is something that should even exist. This is, I believe, because of the hierarchy of knowledge that devalues understanding the gender construct. Parachute science that tries to just save, you know, other people who go, go save other um, communities without valuing their work and their research and, and trying to at least amplify their voice um, into uh, working on their own problems. Race science, um, there was just a recent um, uh, incident, many recent incidents um, where a bunch of scientists um, wrote a letter to uh, pull some articles um, uh, out of, I, I believe it was um, Elsevier uh, journal or some other journals. Their entire CS community is like the theoretical computer science community that's ex excluding people at the margins while working on quote unquote fairness. This is also similar to parachute science. So you're devaluing the knowledge and lived experience that people at the margins come with and you're working to fix their problem <laughs> while, while bringing your uh, knowledge and, and not really working with them to um, amplify their voices. Ethics boards um, without the inclusion of people at the margins. This is these are some articles that came out about um, Silicon Valley and various other initiatives. So I, I don't mean to pick on Pietro because he only told me what many others um, tell other people behind my back. Um, but he asked me, what about curiosity-based research? My question is, whose curiosity-based research is funded because of this hierarchy of knowledge? Whose voice is currently amplified? And this imbalance between whose research is funded and whose um, currently amplified, uh, whose voice is currently amplified, can create harmful, quote unquote, curiosity-based research. So some of the race-based science that I talked about is one. Um, all of this, uh, there's been some works, like I said, by Morgan Claus, um, Fahd uh, Hamidi, Stacy Branham, and many others who, for example, give an example of uh, ha the harms caused by um, automatic gender recognition uh, uh, works, right? I'm not sure if this is curiosity-based research, but I'm pretty sure that some people who, did, who are, were working on this research didn't think that it could cause harm to many people, especially people in the trans community. So what I want to close by is saying that this assumption that your position in society is not affecting the research that you're doing, is not affecting the research that I'm doing. My position in study is not affecting the research that I'm doing, whether it's curiosity driven or otherwise, is false and we should get rid of it. We should um, teach people otherwise. We should teach people to move away from, quote unquote, the view from nowhere. Here's one example, uh, which is an interview for, uh, with Sabelo, which I highly recommend. Talks about, for example, how some of these beliefs from people are infused in the very foundations of 
of, of our field, machine learning, AI, whatever. So for example, he gives an example about how Leibniz was um, building ideas from Raymond Lull, a 13th century Frenchman who thought he could derive a symbolic language that would let him build a logic machine that would convert Muslims to Christianity through reason. We cannot go on assuming that our belief system and our <laughs> uh, our uh, uh, where we are in society does not affect the outcome of the research that we have. So um, in conclusion, I want to say that the hierarchy of knowledge is a result of power structures. Those with power always get keep those without power, thinking that their knowledge is uh, um, higher in the hierarchy than the knowledge of people without power. In my opinion, this is the foundation of issues on fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics, and socio-technical systems, AI, technology, whatever. It's not just an industry versus academia um, issue. I, I don't necessarily like that um, dichotomy many times. Uh, we need to change how we teach these disciplines, and we need to change what is valued in our conferences, schools, and companies. And this affects all forms of the research that we are doing, all parts of the research production uh, mechanism. What questions are considered important? What, is, what do we mean by rigor? Why do we care about certain kinds of rigor and not others? There's many times where we motivate our works by saying it's going to help this kind of people or that kind of people, but that part is not really uh, questioned uh, as something that's not rigorous. What does it mean for something to work? Who decides whether something works versus not? What does it seem, uh, mean for something to be good science? Um, so, you know, I thought I'd take a picture of some of my, my uh, books that I used as an undergrad. They were like in, in, in a shelf at home. And so they were like introduction to MATLAB, C, CMOS design, understanding Delta Sigma data converters, Oppenheim Schaefer, that's a classic, um, uh, signal processing, electromagnetic waves, uh, design of CMOS circuits, modern VLSI devices, how things work, etc. And I never had these books. These are the books I currently have because I'm really trying to catch up from the years and years and years of lack of education that I should have had about some of these things. So Sorting Things Out is a book I haven't read yet, but that was recommended to me by Alex Hanna. It talks about how the, the need to, uh, for classification in science, how it uh, manifests itself in the world. Ruined by Design is a book that um, uh, Ruha Benjamin had recommended. Black Software, something I, I have yet to read. Um, statistics book, of course. Algorithms of, of Oppression by Sophia Noble. Uh, Captivating Technology, uh, I guess this was edited by Ruha Benjamin. Race After Technology by Ruha Benjamin. Haben, who is a deafblind um, uh, disability rights scholar. Um, this is her uh, um, autobiography. Simone Brown uh, writing about surveillance and technology called Dark Matters. And Artificial and Intelligence by Meredith um, Bursart. So I invite all of you or all of us to kind of make up for the years of the lack of education we've had um, on, these, um, on, this, on these issues and, and, and start reading up a little bit more. Um, with that, I'd like to thank many of my colleagues in the Ethical AI team. Um, and uh, this team has grown, especially Emily Denton, with whom I've talked a lot uh, about these uh, issues. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tim. That was a fantastic talk. So um, the first question is from Peter Dolan. He's saying, thank you for this talk and an important point. Um, when I think about what we do to address the effects of a hierarchy of knowledge, I realize that I just keep coming up with alternative hierarchies of knowledge. Do you have any thoughts on this? <laughs> Great point. It's a very good point. And I think that um, it could be that. It could be a different hierarchy of knowledge. But when you, I find that when you work in an interdisciplinary team and everybody has, you know, more equal power, like, for example, when people in the social sciences are not relegated to, like, after, you know, um, people you bring in after the fact, or when we were talking about ethics of, well, I'm thinking about large language models now. And when you bring people in with certain expertise in the very, very beginning, and they have the same amount of power as you, I think you can duke it out, right? Like in, in, in project, on a project by project basis or, or on a work by work basis, um, some ideas might, might uh, be put forth more than others. And so I think that yeah, I, I would say it's it's kind of 
you know, you might come up with a different hierarchy of knowledge depending on who has the power at the time. But when you try to sort of equalize the power people have at different disciplines, um, I, I think there's less of a chance for that to happen. One example is Je Jennifer Chase at Microsoft Research um, is a, well, was at Microsoft Research. She started the New York, New York lab and she um, herself is a theoretical a computer scientist and a physicist, but the very first person she hired was a social scientist. And, and you could see, and Dana Boyd, I think was the first person she hired. And I, you can see that the amount of respect Jennifer has for like some of these people, like Mary Gray was also the person, one of the, an, an anthropologist. You can see the difference um, in the way their research is elevated because even though Jennifer is not from that discipline, she gave a lot of equal weight to the people from different disciplines. Excellent. Um, there are a number of questions that are kind of related to a similar topic, which you mentioned this, a lot of what you're working on has been how to improve the process to be taking these things into account, whether it's the data or the models. So one question that probably sums it up is um, with you know all of these discoveries and insights, what actions would you suggest computer scientists or data scientists or machine learning folks um, do that are working technology do day to day in their jobs to kind of move things forward and take on some of the ideas and learnings that you've had? Um, I think the, the first um, thing I would recommend is trying to read the books, some of the books I recommended. I'm having a hard time. I'm, I'm so bad at like reading entire books these days. My attention span is so short. Um, and so some people asked if we could get the books in copy pasteable form. I'm sure I, I, I can do that um, after, after the event. So I think educating yourself is, is the very first step. And then the second step, my number one, I think, um, advice would be for the leaders. I've, I've, I've seen that it's, you know, when a leader um, has a certain kind of um, attitude, it percolates through the organization. But from the bottom up, if their leader doesn't have that attitude, it's much harder to make any sort of change. And so I think that for the day-to-day -day data scientists, I would say my advice would be read some of these books because they tell you, I swear, they have much better advice like for the day-to-day -day, um, data scientists than I do, and I'm trying to learn from them. So for example, one of them is not to jump to a tech solution. Some, some, some things are not a tech solution, right? Some things are maybe about the process by which you design something. And so people have written about value-sensitive design um, so like not don't think about being unbiased because we're not unbiased. It's impossible. I think that's one of the things I was trying to say in the talk is we're not unbiased. There's no such thing as an unbiased data set. So one thing to think about is what by what values should we choose? So people in value sensitive design, this is the, like Batia Friedman, I, I think has a book. This is the kind of thing they think about. Um, th people think about participatory design, some of these things. So I, I I guess, um, in short, my my advice would be to read some of these other books, um, follow some of the people I mentioned in the talk, and they give specific, um, specific other specific advice. And for the leaders, like you, you know, it's much harder for people working in your organization to advocate for these kind for this kind of change if you're not into it. Like at Google, we just hired um, three social scientists in our team. Um, the very first one being extremely difficult to hire as a research scientist. Oh my God. I mean, but like at least Sammy was supportive. So he's here. Um, he's also my manager. So I have to say nice things, but anyways, um, <laughs> but like if Sammy wasn't supportive, I mean, it was already so difficult to do it. We wouldn't be able to do any of this stuff. Right. So I think my first advice would be for the leaders. Okay. Um, another question is what are your thoughts on incorporating, um, ideas from critical race theory into computer science? I think they're very important. So one example, um, so I think that like um, our ideas about how race is a social construct, um, it, it, a, lot, a lot of them are discussed in critical race theory. Alex Hanna and our team, um, Emily Denton and Jamila smith Laws and Andy Smart have a, a paper called um, A Critical Race Theory Approach to Fairness. So they, they it, it sort of like talks about how some of these works in fairness, like some some paradigms that they have that could be harmful. And so it, it like talks about how you can infuse some of these ideas from critical race theory. So that's one paper I recommend. 
Um, and I think people like Ruha Benjamin, um, like again, her, her book is amazing and her keynote is amazing. Uh, they have a lot of, people in this field have, have already made a lot of important co contributions um, to justice and these, um, this kind of discourse that we should definitely learn from it and bring it into our disciplines. Right. Um, I guess a question that I have for you is, um, what tools do you wish that you had that would help with this challenge of understanding bias, mitigation, um, group fairness topics, these sorts of things? I think that the, for the one tool I'd like to have is um, a tools to help me better um, look, uh, look through and understand data sets. Um, I just feel like we, we're not spending a lot of time trying to understand data. So one group, I know at, at Google, for example, Pair has this tool called Know Your Data tool that's really um, helpful. And I, I would like those kinds of tools to be like much more expanded. Um, so just, just for me personally. Um, and so I'm thinking even more about the question that you just asked, but that's one, one off the top of my head. Okay, great. A related question here in the chat is um, to address the challenges, what is the best way to address the challenges and unconscious bias on our data collection algorithms when starting out a new project? It's really difficult because, like I said, our standpoint and society always will affect this kind of how we approach something. So I don't, um, I think the best thing to do is to involve a lot of people from that are, that are very different from where you are. So if it's if I'm at a company, that would be um, someone who is not at a company, like who's a community organizer, so that I can talk to them about these ideas and things like that. Now, that's really hard because sometimes you don't want to do it in an exploitative way. Like I'm getting paid all this money to do this kind of stuff. They, they're they not, right? And so how do we have this kind of um, partnership where the, they're not being exploited? So the, the, where, what I recommend here is participatory design approaches. Um, so if you look at, for example, there is a workshop, um, PAML is the um, abbreviation. It was at iClear, Participatory Approaches to Machine Learning. I, I recommend some of those works there. And I think people in HCI have been working in these kinds of um, methodologies. So that's what I would recommend. And so people have a term called um, predatory inclusion. That's where, you know, we're trying to include people um, so that to, to avoid this bias that you discussed that, that the person just asked about, but we can do it in a predatory manner that, that, you know, kind of benefits us, but not them. And so there are people who talk about how to avoid some of those kinds of um, procedures, processes. Excellent. Well, we're um, over time a little bit, but I really appreciate um, answers to all these questions and they're several requests for the book list and actually your slides. And so we can work out afterwards, um, whatever you're willing to share, we'll make it available to people. So definitely sounds thank good. You very thank much. you. Great talk and great answers to some really engaging questions. All right. Thank you so much.